Good afternoon. It's five o'clock on Tuesday, March the 1st here in London and in Amsterdam. That makes it six o'clock European time. It does. My guest this week is the peripatetic Sharon O'Day, <laughs> um, who we are meeting for the first time, but have been, as often happens, circling each other on Twitter. Love following her Twitter feed, although somewhat jealous when she was in Mexico and then Thailand before that lately. So a um, I, I, way I put it is you is I like the phrase WFA when everybody started talking about oh what's it mean not being in the office you're kind of going well okay I've been like doing this for 20 years so I call it working from anywhere so I think you kind of work from anywhere but uh, I'm just uh, it, I love your Twitter feed and basic and whatever you talk about so I'm um, I know you have a professional life you don't tend to talk about that um, <laughs> and really I'm just uh, here to um, hear what's on your mind and what, what's now and what's next. So perhaps just say a little bit about yourself and then whatever is on your mind. Okay, uh, no pressure. So my name is Sharon O'Day. Um, I um, I always hate this, what do you actually do kind of question, but I guess the simple answer is I'm a digital strategist. So I really specialize in digital workplace collaboration and the future of work. Um, so I tend to work with larger, more complex organizations to help them understand the right mix of technology, but also processes, culture, governance, and so on, that they need to communicate and collaborate effectively uh, with their employees and sometimes also with their customers. Uh, how long have you been focused on that? Oh, mumble years. Um, so mumble I guess years. it's one of those sort of fell into it things, but I guess I've been in the internal comm space. Um, and in digital communications since about 2006. Mm -hmm. um, I, so I started out publishing. I'm a communicator by profession. Mm -hmm. um, so I started out in journalism um, at The Guardian, in fact, and then on a newspaper that no one read in Bolivia. And from there, I moved into, into communications, for a whole load of government organizations, and then into banking. Uh, but I'm really a, I'm a lifelong nerd. So I've been tinkering with, mm -hmm. uh, with websites and with early um, incarnations of social media since since the 90s really so I just so happened to be that being a communicator as all of this kind of social media and social communication thing was on the rise uh, kind of somehow turned into um, an actual job and a career um, and I've been doing that ever since really. And that's an interesting transition um, from communications internal comms uh, into digital workplace and everything that goes with that and a digital strategist I, it's, it's 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 when it's, it's uh I, I, interesting is one of those banned words in communication <laughs> right? so um intriguing um it, I, and i'm just it, uh, I, I approach it from a different angle i was running businesses for many years um and then i kind of got obsessed with the fact that you couldn't you couldn't measure culture because i'm a recovering accountant so i'm, I'm good at, I, i'm fluent in finance i'm passable in english no dutch at all <laughs> um and so i just got got obsessed with that that's kind of my backstory but i'm my 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 if you will my paid gig is working with business leaders on uh and really what i work with them on is not anything to do with their business it's it's all to do with culture communications and and leadership's all about people right so it's all about communication so i approach it in a perhaps a different angle and i will say that the first after the first couple of months of just being locked down and nobody doing anything much at all, once the pandemic started, I was run off my feet with people just talking to me about what does the workplace look like now? Mm -hmm. I said, well, the first thing is you need to communicate with people. Well, what do I say? I said, well, <laughs> you know, and there's interesting conversations around that. So obviously the digital workplace, the whatever all that looks like has it's been a big part of my work for the last couple of years, but just approaching it from a different direction. So Absolutely. So, I mean, these days I do less, well, I can't even remember the last time I actually produced some communications, but that it's actually trying to understand what is stopping that communication from happening. Hmm. So often we'll have an organization will come along and say, we've, they've either got a technology, but it's just not working. So you might have teams or whatever it might be, but you know, the engagement just isn't there or they have an old platform that is maybe a burning platform, they need to replace it. But often there's an over-focus on that technology mm -hmm. when actually the real reasons why communication isn't happening are much more likely to be to do with the culture, leadership, mm -hmm. some of the processes they have around that. Often there are big governance challenges. And the thing that I often find is, um, is a lack of understanding of user needs. So it's kind of combining 
my knowledge of communications and being a communicator by background myself with actually the, the sort of digital product manager side, which is what does that look like? Who is our customer? What is the user need? And how do we design our communication products, channels, processes so that um, so they're more effective? Um, so it tends to be that we end up on focusing on programs that are potentially unblocking what you already have rather than necessarily recommending a new technology. Hmm. So it's the people and communication side of it. Somewhat. Absolutely. So if you had a large corporation come to you and say, we've heard you do this kind of thing. Um, we've got the tech, but it, it doesn't seem to be working. Or this people is, aren't using it. What would you start? pretty much all my work at the moment. So, you know, two years ago, almost exactly two years ago now, you know, the pandemic came along and people were sent home with their laptops and they probably had teams, but they weren't really using it. And the reality is people have kind of muddled together, you know, uh, some sort of facsimile of whatever they might have been doing in the office previously. So they're doing a lot of video calls. They're not actually, a, they've got actually the right tools in place, you know, inside their organization. They simply don't have either the culture or the skills or the knowledge um, to be able to use those to work more effectively because we've now got the opportunity to have this step change in how we work you know we've, we've broken the connection between work and place and potentially also between work and time so that we can work in ways that are much more distributed but to really take advantage of that we don't simply just have to spend our entire day on teams calls or zoom calls we actually need to rethink how work gets done and that is often quite countercultural. it requires us to take a different approach to <laughs> to management, to supervision, to performance, to, to so many other aspects of how we get um, how we get things done at work, hmm. which is a, a huge change, which is where I end up in the sort of future of workspace. I'm always thinking about what's next. Yeah, it, it's fascinating. I, I, I mean, that's a great piece of language I heard you use, that we've broken the connection between work and place, and to some extent between work and time. And if you go back into really old technology, I used to live in the Cayman Islands for many, it's my home, but I, I live in London now, it, for 27 years. Mm -hmm. And in the early 90s, because we were in, internet really started like 94, 95, email that is, um, the biggest law firm in Cayman had lights burning brightly in part of the building 24 hours a day, seven days a week, mm -hmm. because they'd opened offices in Hong Kong and London. That was the fax room in the days before email. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the big documents were sent by FedEx on memory sticks or whatever back then. Um, but that was breaking a connection between work time. Absolutely, and I, you know, um, work. So that's that's also fascinating. And distributed teams, you know, the advantage of doing that. Which is, I find this really fascinating because before I started my own consultancy practice, I worked for a big global bank for years. Mm -hmm. And actually, although they do work in those really distributed ways that we kind of, have, the rest of us have got used to um, ever since, which is, you know, we've got colleagues on the other side of the world, that, or even down the road, that potentially we haven't spoken to or met. So people are, are able to collaborate mm -hmm. and communicate across distance, but somehow we haven't quite, or hadn't quite broken um, mm. that that time aspect, that people would do their nine to five, and we would always find some sort of awkward meeting slot at eight o'clock in the morning or seven, mm. or six, or, you know, if it was really urgent, then even earlier or later in the day for someone, when actually we need to rethink that much more fundamentally so that we're not relying on one another to be online at the same time. And once we do that, we are actually able then to Hmm. become much more distributed geographically but also to tap into talent markets across the world um, yeah. and work potentially much more effectively and efficiently it's i mean i'm dying we're diving into this because we, we both obviously do a lot around this and are interested in it um yes I, I mean i have quite a number of young adults um around me so um and they're of an age where they're very identity conscious so you don't talk about their who they are and what they're about uh, one of them, we're talking sort of 20, early to mid twenties, and you know when things one space in the UK and works for a global bank. Mm -hmm. I said, so you're going to go back into the office? How many days a week do you need? He says, well, I mean, our team is on three continents already, so it's like we really figured one to two days a week, um, but any more than that doesn't really work for the team. <laughs> you know, um, another one is based in Cayman mm -hmm. and manages a team, half of whom are in India. Yeah, she's literally the other side of the world on time zones. So they have the advantage of effectively almost a 24 seventeen. Um, but the disadvantage of the fact that they need to be on calls at 
weird times of day to check just for check-ins just yeah. to be the manager to check in with them how's things going what do you need um and a I mean, a little odd one, I, I look to sort of model certain behaviors and going back to when you all were in the same time zone. Um, I'm old enough to remember before email and I even used to, you know, hand write documents as an accountancy apprentice and send them to the typing pool. Um, but I, the Cayman Islands is all about communication globally. It always has been. Mm -hmm. When Blackberries came out, in like oh three oh four, and then also you could have to eat these new emails which you'd only had for a couple of years. All of a sudden, they're on your in your hands, and then that became instead of being this, you might remember the the theory from Keynes in the thirties that we'd all be people of leisure and we'd only work three or four oh, hours yeah. a day. Whereas in fact, what actually happened and still happens is that we're connected all the time. Except the disease now is called Slack, uh, yep. or, or Teams chat or whatever. So we set up a we had a business we were running that was working all over the place, and we just said, look. For the team itself, you may communicate at any time, but the core hours for each office, any emails received after the core hours, there, sh there has to be no expectation of them being replied to until core hours the next day. Right. And the and, and global so, so, organizations have been doing this for years. So, yeah. you know, when we talk about we need to get people back to the office, they can collaborate. Actually, big banks, multinational corporations have been grappling with these challenges for a decade, if not more. I mean, the first program I did when I worked at Stantar was exactly that. It was creating more lo location independent um, working, actually at the time, so that we didn't have people commuting in the London Olympics when there might have been a more speed right. Right. on the team. Organisations have been grappling with some of this. And it's actually the difference, I think, that's happened over the last couple of years has been previously co-located organizations are now grappling with the same challenges and maybe they haven't been had the opportunity mm. to work those through so one of the uh, quite alarming stat i read recently was productivity for knowledge workers did not fall during right. during covid but people worked more hours so their productivity per hour dropped because things that used to be relatively simple you know you used to be able to lean across the desk and go dave do you know where that file is or could you yeah. show me how this thing works suddenly becomes complicated yeah. suddenly we're much more reliant on our digital tools to do quite basic stuff you know to book things to access help to find the information that we need but what so what people have found is that they're then trying to compensate for their lack of productivity by working longer rather than smarter and yeah. that's having all manner of impacts on on well-being in particular but also yeah. you know some of that work-life balance stuff and this whole conversation around you know we're not just kind of um, working from home, but living at work to some degree. And that's yes. people who are challenged, who are grappling with what we used to have. You know, my other half would complain constantly that I was always on my work phone and getting emails at hmm. every hour of the day or night. Actually, how do we start to set appropriate boundaries so that we hmm. get that balance of responsiveness um, and also the need to really respect people's work life balance? These are challenges that people are now working through and kind of go back a full a full circle here when we talk about you know what's next for a lot of organizations it's kind of unpicking the bad habits of the last two years it's about you know we went home we got through that crisis period but everyone's over it now mm -hmm. we want to take what we learned during that period and some of it was great in terms of you know helping people to assess the mm -hmm. way that they get work done to work more effectively to stop doing some of the bad practices we used to have to really accelerate bringing in the technology uh, programs and platforms that we need to get work done but actually a lot of it is we need to relearn um, our management behaviors, our collaboration, because collaboration is a skill by itself. We need to learn. It, it requires much more um, overt, explicit communication with our colleagues that potentially we're just not used to, it. particularly for those of us who've maybe got um, our backgrounds in, in regulated industry. You're used to not constantly narrating what you're doing because there is an expectation you keep things close to your chest. And we're having to sort of relearn, and particularly for those of us who are a little bit older who come, you know, um, maybe to relearn how to manage and relearn how to communicate so that we're able to do that in those ways that are distributed across place and time. Hmm. Um, centering on the, rather than the detail, centering on the core theme of breaking the connection between work and place and work and time, it's, and the piece you were talking about is you might be looking at technology, but actually, mm -hmm. fundamentally, a lot of the organizations, certainly larger ones, will already have the technology. Yep. But they're kind of going, yeah, it's not really kind of working for what we need now if people are location independent, etc. Um, and it's going back to first principles. I think it's fascinating. It's, it's 
one of the in lazinesses of being the language the language of co-located is good like one office in london amsterdam mm -hmm. wherever um like it the the people are so used to behaving in a certain way and like like so many people i did and i'm sure you did we're like countless events on zoom or teams in the first year of the pandemic and now somebody says do you want to come on something at seven o'clock in the evening and, and really <laughs> the answer is generally no mm -hmm. um, whereas in the first few months it was yes i'm you know locked in the house whatever but now it comes about what type of thing is it going to be and mm -hmm. you'll have things like webinars that are put on which has no interaction with the audience and i'm going okay just send me the recording <laughs> i don't need to be there uh, but there, there are all kinds of experimental ones. And at some point, one of the, one of the like net, loose networks I was in um, put on one and said, we're going to try this app. And I'm I, somebody who cannot stand networking events. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm the one who stands in the corner and talks to somebody I know. Right? It's just, you know, I, I'm pretty conversational, but I'm not a, an extrovert in a loud space. Um, and somebody come up with an app that effectively mimicked a stand up networking event. Did it work? I well, mean, it was, did you feel like you were actually? It was really weird because you had to have the same dynamics. So people would form groups and you could see them and you could walk over to them and you could join the, you could listen in on the conversation if you were close enough and you could join the conversation if mm -hmm. you stepped in another step and you just use your mouse or, or trackpad or whatever. And, and it did kind of work, but mm -hmm. it reminds me of, we once did a, some training for um, a professional services firm um, offshore for a big event, and they were very, very socially awkward. Let's put it this way, even, even like me or worse. And luckily, we had somebody who was drama trained. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, well, if there's, what do you do if there's two people standing having a conversation uh, over, you know, a drinks event or something? And how do you join the conversation? And they taught them how to do that in a physical way as an actor would go to their mark or something and i thought my god you need to teach that for this and what really struck me about this particular app whether or not it's taken off was it was designed completely to replicate something from that was dependent upon location that was dependent upon pseudo random interactions that was dependent upon doing something it was a replication online of what's happened now um, there's uh, somebody uh, that I talked to early in the pandemic who was like almost a goddess to facilitators right? mm -hmm. because she had every tool for doing it digitally. So even before the pandemic, lots of facilitators were doing things in you know multi-jurisdiction. How do you do it? And how do you do it so you're not just trying to whiteboard or whatever? Yeah. And the biggest frustration, and then much of their work is with universities, and of course they were run off their feet. Um, and of course, they were simply trying to replicate the old ways of doing things. Yeah. So I think when you take the disconnect, disconnect work and place and work and time, and you go, what we have these people, these knowledge workers, um, and we have solutions we're looking for them to create for us. What what are we looking to get? And therefore, what's getting in our way? And as you're saying, it's not likely to be the technology. It's likely to be the way people manage hierarchically, how they how they do things up, down and sideways. And I guess if you're looking at first principles, if you were to come into an organization or if you were giving advice now to somebody who's listening who runs a business, mm -hmm. they go, well, we've probably got Teams and Zoom and we've got found a way to model through our services, but um, how can we really take advantage of this? Where would you start? I always start with discovery, which is, you know, actually spend some time understanding what are the real barriers to it working successfully at the moment. So uh, I always, I have a little model I describe as my, my Miss Marple model, which is um, when you're trying to identify in, uh, you know, any sort of crime drama who did the murder, you're actually looking for three things, which are the means, motive and opportunity. And what we often find is people have the means, that is to say they might have teams or similar collaboration technology, the things that are missing are either opportunity, which is do they have time in their day and the right kind of, um, so, you know, when you have people in say frontline roles or who are, whose time is otherwise managed then the opportunity is often the issue. But the, the, the other one is the, the motivation. Actually, is it that there's fundamentally nothing there worth reading or are they otherwise disengaged and simply don't care enough about your organization to spend their time 
you know engaging in that sort of way so mm. actually there is that over focus on means and then under focus on on the other two the other two elements that I often find so often when I talk to organizations I will say let's spend some time actually understanding what I find really valuable is if I go into organizations and, and spend some time understanding the myriad ways in which they go out of their way to not use the channels that you provide so they'll have hugely convoluted routes to to finding things on, on sort of shared drives the amount of stuff that people have printed on their desks or, or you know or the other routes that they will use to access information it's fascinating to do that kind of workplace anthropology so that's broadly where i would start but anyone can do that with really pretty basic research skills which is to really get into the um, the detail of what is it about your existing communications channels processes that are simply just not working I and start from that you know what so ultimately what so Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, carry on. You dive too much. So, Miss Marple means motive opportunity. <laughs> they typically got the means, there may be time or other constraints, they may not have the opportunity. But it's interesting you then got into the motivation, and that's mm. I'm, I'm assuming I'm looking at this as a almost a lay person, so I, right. I know enough to be dangerous, but not that much more. Um, so there's a degree of desk research you could go and look, you could go and look at it, or have somebody look at it and go. Well, what are people doing with shared resources? Are they using yeah. them? Are they downloading them, et cetera? But then I guess there was this also cross-sectional interviewing in an organization. Yeah, I would say I often like do detective. a little bit of um, going into organizations and we'll we'll do interviews either, well, or usually both with both um, you know, some of your leadership team, people in sort of key management roles to understand what is it about their area that is potentially mm -hmm. a challenge. And yeah, end user interviews to say, you know, how do you look for specific things? Where mm -hmm. do you go for information? It's sort of identifying you know some of the informal networks that people use or rather otherwise they're informal channels you that kind of it's it's basic user research like you might do for an external product as well to understand mm -hmm. what are what are the barriers to to um successful engagement and i i think one of the tendencies in old school leadership is to be hierarchical and mm -hmm. to go well you have to do it this is the way we're doing it you have to use it and there's there is a place for rules and strictures etc but it's a but it's a, a very caribbean phrase is it's, it's it's a lot easier to pull than to push a rope yeah so if people are motivated and so hope, hopefully they know what they're there to do and what the success look like and what has been productive look like but if they're not doing it and if they're not collaborating and and being connected and mm -hmm. other people and and resources it's that's... We also need to remember collaboration is an, an end in itself. You know, we're, if we're talking about an outcome, people collaborate in order to get their work done. Yeah, exactly. So actually, you know, I'm, another phrase I massively overuse is utility is the number one driver of adoption. So we need to find the things people actually need to do. Right. And then you might need to put your communications in the way of them doing that. So they happen to see it, you know, as part of that okay. journey. Or you identify what it is that they're actually, what do they actually need? And is it simply that what we're giving them is unnecessary or wrong? It's, I've always got a vision of like a paid Google ad in the middle of an intranet, right? Towards the most common channels. It's like, you just see a thing though. that says, oh, by the way, sign up for a random coffee. <laughs> it's it's not like... even that. It's actually ultimately people. So when the, in, the intranet is a great example, no one goes to the intranet to read their workplace news. Simply no one cares about what your CEO is doing that much. What they do is they're opening their browser to look at the weather, to find out something else they might need to do. To you know, whatever it is, and that you need to put what you're doing in their face mm -hmm. on the way to doing the thing that they are actually intending to do, which is how all sorts of other kind of marketing messaging works. So it is simply about precisely what is it that people are trying to do? Is it they're trying to get a job done? Mm -hmm. And we can also think about, you know, actually, is it helping them to do that thing? And if it isn't, then what's it for? Well, I, I think of an example. One of the things that people have looked to do um, to create elements of serendipity is to have things like random coffees yeah. in an organization. But they might not be motivated to do that. But if you had your own intranet on your web browser and you go in there and you, you're going to look at the things you look at in the morning on your dashboard or whatever, mm -hmm. and you see something there goes like, you know, and it becomes stories, because I'm a huge one for storytelling. So it's about stories of successes for how people met and did something. And you go, oh, you know, and you make, and you say like, 30 seconds and you could watch a video or something so it's 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 a marketing strategy that's internal isn't it if you absolutely were. and that's quite an interesting point sort of slightly tangential around actually one of the other 
So when we look at data of how people have worked has changed just over the course of the pan pandemic, hmm. one thing we've found is that people are generally, a lot of data seems to show people are working longer. But the other thing that seems to have happened is people's social circles have collapsed. Yes. So when we, so we, we've become much closer to the people that we work with really regularly, mm -hmm. but we, our, our actual ability to tap into broader networks, whether that's our network across, you know, the industry or even within our own organization seems to have got worse because we've, we basically we're just um, building off established trust and people that we maybe only used to see a couple of times a year would just check in with less frequently we've kind of they've fallen off our radar a bit so mm. one of the challenges we do have over the next year is how do we re-establish that um mm. you know microsoft call it inner and inner and outer loop how do we help people to tap into that outer loop in their own organization because that is where the magic happens really where that's where things like innovation come from that's mm. also what makes us get excited about about coming to work it's not simply about the five or six people we work with every day but where what makes us you know excited about what comes next or excited about the organization we work for is really having that much broader understanding of the ecosystem and where we're going so there is there is a need to think a bit more creatively about how do we help people to tap into the broader whole and if we link to that to that if we link that to this is actually about getting work done and having results and yep. Because the vast majority of people aren't running their own business, like you know, they're, they're they're in a job. They need career progression. They need monitoring, and, and they need to you know have their their performance mm -hmm. assessed and how they're doing and all that kind of stuff. So what will motivate them is things that help them do their job and 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 progress. And the late Tony Shea, who created an amazing culture at Zappos, built the Zappos headquarters in Las Vegas. And he designed, it was all co-located. There were a thousand plus people, often call center stuff, mm -hmm. right? Was, I mean, you know, most online businesses have huge call centers. Um, and th they had to funnel through a narrow hallway and every single member of staff from the top to the bottom, because it was a hierarchy at some level, um, had, to, had, to, had to do that. And they literally bumped into each other. And because he believed in what he called ROCs, ROCs, and the RO stood, always stood for return on. Oh, yeah. So ROC, return on culture, our return on community, and one of them is called return on collisions. Okay. And so I'm somebody who, much like Tony Shade, does not believe in coincidence. I believe in, in creating space for serendipity. Mm-hmm. Um, I also believe there is Zemblanity people out there, which is the opposite of people who have serendipities. They're people to whom bad things always happen. Um, but good things happen by creating space for it. So if we were to say, so what happened was that nobody objected to the collisions at the literally bumping into people in Zappos because it created space for serendipities. And they were then encouraged to go and if you bump into somebody, have a conversation with them if you're waiting for the lift or whatever. So. And this was ultimately much like the, the much vaunted Google 20% time and stuff was actually designed to see where the magic happens. Mm -hmm. So if we linked, and that's just a story example, but if we linked, if businesses linked that there's a benefit to the business and to the people working in the business to have a degree of ran, structured randomness to it, like then they'd be much more likely to take advantage of opportunities that somebody in the company does like random coffees before we before we went live we were just you were just talking about uh, the idea of having a you know emailing 100 people you wanted to talk to a year and you said last year you got to talk to 62 of them yeah well, i mean i talked to 52 people well maybe with a couple of holidays 50 people a year on these and the vast majority of them are people i've never met before um, exactly that. I have a list of 100 people you that I. Interesting people, you know. All of that comes a big full circle there. So I, um, for a friend of mine, Mary McKenna, came up with this idea of where she moved back to Ireland. She needed to be a bit more intentional about meeting people. So mm -hmm. she wrote a list of people that sort of you know were in her network, uh, but maybe had fallen off the radar a little bit, um, and that she wanted to catch up with before the year was out. And I've been doing that for about. I copied that off her, and I've been doing it for about four years now. Um, so we actually make a real effort to get in touch with people and go. I know I'll follow you on Twitter. It'd be really great to catch up, or you know, I'm going to be in London. Let's go for a coffee. Actually, being much more structured about it. And what I find with all of that is, 
I'm yet to meet one I didn't like and I normally will learn something new and every now and then something will come out of it you know that we might have an opportunity to to work together on something or you mm-hmm. know it's just someone that I could tap into for some advice now and again but it's actually being much more intentional about about building that network taking it back to what you were saying before about how do we how do we create those opportunities? There's, there's an um, academic article I, I wang on about quite frequently by a guy called Eric M. M. Eisenberg. And he talks about actually, if you think about it as the model of, um, you know, a few guys who get together in a garage and, and jam as a band, mm-hmm. that, that's, that's actually a brilliant kind of collaboration because at the beginning of that, you don't have a set idea in mind of what the music will sound like. You've just got an idea that, you know, you're going to get together mm-hmm. and that you're going to make some music. So actually, what you, but there are some kind of preconditions there that you need to have. Basically, everyone needs to be able to have a basic level of competence at whatever instrument it is that they've picked up, mm-hmm. and the ability to set some sort of rules. You know, what kind of meter or or, or type of music are we playing? So mm-hmm. actually, there was a little bit there around. We need to create a structure for that that mm-hmm. serendipity, and we need to get the right kind of skills together to make it happen. But we need to be much less defined about what that looks like. And the challenge I think we have in the workplace is there is the sense that we only ever set people specific tasks with defined yeah. outcomes when yeah. actually what we want to do if we want serendipity is to be much more comfortable with the idea that the outcome is undefined yes that makes sense so when we are thinking about that broader loop there how do we help people to tap in is it that we need to create more opportunities for people with maybe complementary skills to mm-hmm. get together on nothing in particular uh, the answer my answer is yes uh, because I've actually seen this with clients and others have deployed it. And at a philosophical level, um, I capture the idea that in order for it to be successful for the business, the highly counterintuitive uh, requirement is that it must not have any defined outcomes. It must That's hugely countercultural for organizations. Or, you know, I was talking to an entrepreneur today who's built a very successful business and is great about vision and ideas, right? But actually doesn't really want to operate their business anymore. So those businesses, you tend to help them by putting in place some structures. When you go with large, with mid to large corporates, um, typically the people who rise to the top of those organizations spent the first 20 years of their careers being, everything was about measurements and outcomes. And then I spend most of my time when I work with those people, get them to say, your job is not to have the answers, but to ask the right questions and to focus on vision and culture. That's it, that's your whole job. If you're measuring stuff, you're, that's not your job anymore to go, but, but my whole career has been based on that. So it's, yeah, it, it is very counterintuitive. To, in order to get results, you need to not be looking for results. Exactly so. And that's really challenging for organizations to get their head around. And as you say, for people within those organizations who don't come from that background to be a bit more um, uh, accepting of, uh, of that kind of lack of structure. And I think my tip to them would be um, talk to me and I can put you onto other people or talk to other people in your peer network and go, what have you done? What was your experience? And you'll find that those who've deployed this and actually and, and gone for it We'll find wow and here's story after story of how it generated actual tangible commercial results um i'm just going to summarize a couple of things you know you, you mentioned the the broken connection between work and place work and time the miss marple piece uh means motive opportunity i love just you know thinking about the fact that it's the detective that it's both the, and you know when we see detective shows on tv 80% of detective work, at least, is very boring desk work and desk research. Um, although some people love desk research, um, just not me. Um, but when you start like forensically looking at how are people using the tools you've got, who's not using them, who's using them, and then you talk about the interviews, which is the bit you do see Miss Marple do on TV. I love that bridge. And then really, you know, there's this ghastly... Cod, um, concatenation of words of marcoms marketing communications but actually you put it together internally and you know any company which has internal systems they're going to be communicating all the time but yes nobody goes to the internet to read the latest update but they will go on there and see a widget that talks about well what's our latest you know story around people doing something serendipitously um and you can join the dots. So I, I'm, I've learned a hell of a lot um, listening, you know, having this conversation and listening to your 
thoughts on what you do. I, I like to give the, the guest the, the last word, and I guess maybe a request would be, what's one tip, you know, in, in amongst your last words, say whatever you like, but what's one tip you would give business leaders from what oh. you, particularly the last couple of years? Okay, over the last couple of years, the biggest thing for me is a tip or more of a general area to consider is actually about the overall employee experience. So in a world where people are much less likely to be in a physical place, the role that digital tools and platforms play for employees is really in sharp focus. And reality is go and take a look at that overall end to end because the it's likely to be an absolute hot mess. Every mm -hmm. single thing that makes it harder to find information is, a, is an irritant that actually makes people's working day less productive and mm -hmm. starts to, to, dig, um, to sort of chip away at engagement. So actually for me, the biggest thing for the next couple of years is really about the digital employee experience and how move, breaking that connection between work and place and working time means that digital tools are really um, more critical than they've ever been. So how do we make sure that those are something that help people to get work done rather than hinder them? Wow, and I am gonna jump in on this rather than leave it last. So digital employee experience. Absolutely. And then I'm a first principles person. So what, I've, what I'm fascinated by is if organizations will commit to research and assess their digital employee experience, that's gonna give them some signals overall for the business beyond that, that go, what are our people doing to solve their problems? Mm -hmm. They might find that there's, people are solving problems at, at all kinds of levels in their organization that, that they didn't even realize they needed to solve. So, exactly it, so. Th there will be absolute gold in that research. So that's just super fascinating. Anyway, I had, as, as always, I had no idea how this was gonna go or where, <laughs> where it was gonna so go. Thank you so much for inviting me It was on. beautifully serendipitous and random and <laughs> I've learned a lot and I hope our podcast listeners do and your, your tribe when you circulate this round to them. Super, thank you so much for having me. Absolute pleasure, Sharon. Thank you and have a good evening in Amsterdam. You too, cheers, bye. bye.